So recently my church reached out to me and asked if I would repair the tithe box that we had that was damaged and it's starting to fall apart from weekly use. And I thought instead of repairing that one, why don't I design and build something even nicer and newer that we can use going forward that's going to hold up a lot better than the current one. In this video I'm going to be showing you guys how I built that and finished that and what it turned out to be. So it's pretty exciting to get to work on something so close to the heart and I hope you guys enjoy the build process. If you're not already following, go ahead and do that and hit the notification bell if you're on YouTube so you can get notified when we make content like this. Thanks. I'm going to start this project by working on the rails and styles for our shaker sides that are going to make up the sides of the tithe box. And I've already gone ahead and milled this lumber, so we're going to be working with curly maple for this project, which is going to leave a nice, beautiful figured pattern once we finish this up. So I've already jointed and planed this so it's ready to rip to its final width and cut to its final length. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. Because my rails across the bottom are going to be a wider width than my styles on the sides, I went ahead and marked each board with the width that I'm going to be cutting it so I can specifically pick which boards are going to be used for which piece before I start cutting. And now I'm going to rip everything down. Alright, now I've got everything ripped to its final width and it's time to do all of my cross cutting to get everything to the right length. Uh, all of my bottom rails are going to be perfectly flat, but the upper rails on the side are going to be angled. So it's going to get a little bit confusing here, so i got to make sure I keep focused so I can get all these angled cuts exactly correct. So once I got everything cut to length and all my angles cut, I wanted to do a quick dry fit of my side pieces because as you can tell these have this angle top that's a little bit complicated so I want to make sure everything matches up correctly and I actually had to cut a hair off. I had done some math wrong I guess but it all works out in the end uh, and the fit up looks good so now I'm going to move on to cutting the joinery which is going to be done with a um, shaker cutter bit. So we're going to be moving to the router table next. So working with tongue and groove sets or shaker bit sets like this, I personally like to start by cutting my tenons or my tongues. I center it roughly on the board, but I have all of my pieces marked with an up and a down. That way I know once everything's assembled, even if I'm not perfectly centered, it'll all end up perfectly flush. You'll also notice that I'm using a following board here, which is a sacrificial piece. This helps not only prevent tear out, but it helps gives a better reference against the fence when cutting the grooves or tenons in smaller pieces. Now that I've cut all of my tenons, I'm going to go ahead and cut all of my grooves and I'm going to use my tenon to actually set the position of my bit for my grooves. This is going to make sure it ends up at the exact right height so everything is flush when I'm done. You may have also noticed that I'm using a ruler here to set the bearing of my router bit flush with my fence. This is a critical step to get very accurate because it's going to prevent you from having an overcut or undercut depth on your grooves. So interestingly enough, my geometry may have been right before I adjusted earlier because once I cut the tongue and groove for the shaker panels, it's back offset. And now the piece that I cut shorter to fit in the dry fit is too long, uh, or is too short rather, so I cut it too short. So the good news is I left myself plenty of extra width here, so what I'm going to do is glue them up, aligning the angled cut at the top, making sure that's nice and flush, and then I'll clean cut the shortest one that's the most offset measure how wide my bottom piece is, and then I'll cut my other two to match that. So not going to be an issue, but I thought it was worth sharing that uh, because of the angle, bringing in the, t uh, the tenon in equal distance, because it's at an angle, is actually a different distance than the distance at the bottom. So it changed how this laid out dry fit versus with the tenons cut. So leave your pieces a little bit bigger than you need to if you're cutting shaker doors with weird angles, and then when you bring them together, it should work out. So. Hope that helps. Now that I've got my tongue and groove joinery cut, it's time to cut center panels, which is going to be quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. I actually like to use six millimeter instead of uh, actually true quarter inch because it just gives a nice snug fit. It still has room to move, which you want. You don't want it to be too tight that it can't expand and contract, but it's a tighter fit than a quarter inch with at least the white sides bit set. So that's just my two cents. Six millimeter plywood's the way to go. But yeah, I'm gonna jump right in. Thank you. 
All right, so I'm starting with the easy panel because it's easy. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm using what are called spacer balls, which are little rubber balls that I bought from Rock Hardware. And these go inside the groove you cut out. And basically what they're supposed to do is keep your panel from sliding around, but allow you to leave it a little oversized so it can roll on the ball, but the ball can also be compressed so you don't have to get it in exact depth. And I think this is gonna make for better panels. I don't know. We'll see. Um, the one thing I have noticed is it doesn't leave a ton of depth, but I don't think that matters because the panel itself isn't going to expand and contract. And because of the amount of compression that's going to be on those balls, it should be able to take up any expansion and contraction that occurs. So I think it's actually a net benefit, but I'm going to try it out, see how it goes. Anyways, here goes the assembly. One important thing to note when gluing up shaker panel doors like this is that you only want to put glue on your tenons. You don't want to glue the center panel to your rails and styles because that's going to prevent the outer rails from being able to expand and contract and can cause issues. Also, it's important to remember that you don't need to over clamp these. As soon as you close the joint, you've got enough clamp pressure. Crushing these down is only going to cause bowing and deflection in your clamps and that's not necessary for these types of doors. So the panels went together really well. Uh, I will say that the spacer balls that I used really, really helped with getting this thing aligned perfectly because you can put clamp pressure and the rubber balls basically put friction, but you can still slide things around. So it let me get everything lined up really nicely. So you put a little bit of clamp pressure and that kind of engages the squishiness in the balls. And then you can kind of roll it around and slowly tighten it up as you get it perfect. So that was actually really, really cool. I thought it was going to be a pain to use versus a a benefit but it actually turned out to be a major benefit made it way easier to put together so um yeah that's really excited to use those going forward and they're like two bucks so <laughs> definitely a worthwhile expense to add to make it easier and to make the panel not slide around because you want to leave again you want to leave your panel floating in shaker style doors so that the panel can expand and contract around it but putting the balls in keeps it from rattling around and keeps your paint or your finish if you're putting finish on it from cracking where the panel's sliding because now it's fixed, which is pretty cool. So yeah, on to the next part. So I pulled these out of the clamps, sanded them flush, and I cut my miters. So these are 45 degree miters. The front piece has two miters and the sides I decided to do miters on the front joint and on the back joint, it's just going to be a butt joint because it's gonna be in the back of this tie of the box that no one's gonna really ever see. So not a big deal if it's just a butt joint and the front corners will be nice and clean all the way around to the back edge. So it's gonna look pretty cool. Um, next up, I'm going to cut the back piece out of a single piece of plywood again, because that's just gonna be a hidden piece. No one's gonna really ever see it. Um, and then I'm gonna move on to joinery. Quick dry fit looks pretty good. Instead of purely going off my design's dimension, I'm using the actual piece here to mark where I need to cut my back panel. This ensures a perfect fit. Since I'm able to hide the hardware and holes inside the cabinet, I decided to use pocket hole joinery to attach the back to the sides. This is a great method when you have something like this because you can, again, keep the joinery hidden on the inside. It's quick, easy, and plenty strong if you use wood glue and screws. Because of the width between my sidewalls, I actually had to use a right angle drill bit to get these to drive home. They do make a shorter pocket hole driver bit that you can use, but I prefer the longer one just because it lets the angle be a little bit cleaner. Once again, I'm flushing up the bottom and using the actual piece to lay out my cut lines. This will ensure a very accurate cut to the true dimension versus just basing my cuts off of my design.
One of the biggest tips that I can give you whenever gluing up miters, even if you're planning to reinforce them with dominoes, dowels, splines, is to use thicker glue. So in this case, I'm using Typon Quick and Thick Glue. This thicker glue is less prone to be pulled into the end grain and will leave a significantly stronger miter joint. So we are planning on doing some reinforcements here, but I still use Quick and Thick because it greatly increases the strength of these miter joints. Here I'm attaching just some quick little alignment blocks. This is gonna give me a reference surface for when I use pocket holes to attach the bottom to this piece. As I mentioned earlier, it's always a good idea to put some reinforcements in your miter joints to give them extra strength. So here I'm laying out some positions for where I'm gonna be using some dovetail miter splines. And I head on over to the router table where I'm gonna be using my dovetail bit, an eight degree bit specifically, to cut some dovetail splines in. Splines and dovetail splines are an easy way to add strength to miter joints after you finish gluing it up. It basically allows for the long grain of the spline to cross between the two pieces of the miter and gives plenty of glue surface. I personally prefer to use dovetail splines over traditional splines because they just look really cool. They're just as easy to make once you've made one or two. It's pretty straightforward and you can actually batch out making the spline pieces all at once. As long as you match up the splines with the right router bit, you can use the same spline for different depth router cuts and it will work just the same, which is super cool and convenient. So I've got a box of these walnut splines and maple splines for the same router bit. Once the glue's dried, I'm just using a multi-tool here to cut close, but not all the way flush with my work surface. You can also use a pull saw or any kind of flush trimming saw here, but I find it's faster to just use multi-tool and follow it up with a low grit sanding operation using my Rotex, but either option works great. Next, I move on to some of my finished sanding. Sanding the center panels proved to be a little tricky because my random orbit sander was too big to fit in, but my 3x4 electric ray from Surf Prep fit in perfectly and made nice, quick work of sanding those center panels. Surf Prep is a partner of our channel, but they make great quality tools, so definitely check them out. Next up, moving on to building the top for my Tide box, and I decided to use this cool curly maple piece with a live edge, so I'm using one of my drill bit attachments that allows me to sand these non-flat surfaces pretty easily. To cut the opening for where the tithes and offerings can go, I used a spiral straight bit and I marked out where I wanted my bit to start and stop so it would be nice and centered on the top. I wanted the top of this piece to have a clean look, so I'm just doing a light round over with a hand sanding block and a light chamfer on the bottom with a little bit heavier of a chamfer on the top. This will make it soft to the touch and soft to interact with, but give it a clean, sharp look, which I think is pretty cool. After some last minute sanding, she is ready for finish, which is where Nicole steps into the process and works her magic. For this piece, we decided to go with an oil-based polyurethane, mainly because it's extra durable and this is something that's gonna be in a high use, high impact situation. So we wanted maximum durability. And honestly, it gives a really nice warmth to the piece as well, which is one of the main benefits of using an oil-based finish like this. Wiping it on uh, with three coats, we're starting with a heavier coat, and then as we go up into our third coat, we go a little bit lighter and make sure that it's nice and smooth. You also wanna make sure whenever you're using polyurethane that you sand with 220 grit between each coat and allow plenty of time for it to dry and cure before you interact with it. To make sure this piece was plenty mobile and could be moved in and out of storage quickly, I wanted to add some casters to it. And I found these really cool casters that attach with the screw-in plate, making it really, really easy to take on and take off. To allow the top of the box to be hinged, I just used a simple piano hinge here. There are plenty of options for hinges, but I wanted the hinge to be hidden on the inside and didn't want to go with anything too fancy like European hinges for this project. So piano hinge worked perfectly. I decided to add a small lock to this box to prevent anybody from tampering with the tithes and offerings while we're in service. 
Whenever you're going to have exposed hardware, brass is always a great option. Well, probably needless to say, we are thrilled with how awesome this tithing box turned out. Um, everything from the way it locks and lifts is just really smooth. The curly maple and the walnut splines just really pop on this piece. And overall, the design just works. So we are really, really happy with it. I think it's gonna be super functional, but also a really nice piece at our church. So I'm really excited to deliver this and to start seeing it every Sunday morning because uh, it's just not everybody really get to do a project with such a purpose as this. And um, yeah, I mean, tithing is an act of worship and uh, building this, I think, uh, was the same for me. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the build. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them down below in the comments. And again, if you haven't already, make sure to like, follow, and hit that notification bell if you're on YouTube so you can be notified when we make content like this in the future. Thanks.